Hello, everyone. I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, I hope uh, many of you have been vaccinated against COVID already or will be receiving the vaccine soon. Uh, my name is Kabe Khoshnud. I'm an associate professor at Yale School of Public Health uh, with an interest in health issues in context of humanitarian crises. And this term, I also serve as the director of undergraduate studies for Yale College students pursuing um, a major in modern Middle East studies. I wanna thank the Yale Council on Middle East Studies for hosting this event and for inviting me to be a moderator. Let me start by a brief introduction of Dr. Omar Dawachi. I had the good, <coughs> good fortune and pleasure of meeting with and spending time with Dr. Dawachi during my multiple visits to Beirut when Dr. Dawachi was a faculty member at the American University of Beirut. I very much enjoyed the range of our conversations and learned much from Dr. Dawachi. I also enjoyed listening to Dr. Dawachi's incredible music, which does not show up on his bio. Dr. Dawachi completed his medical degree at the College of Medicine at the University of Baghdad, the country's oldest medical school. Afterwards, he began his residency at Al Madina, Iraq's largest teaching hospital. A year later, he had to flee Iraq due to safety concerns for physicians who experienced horrific violence. He next completed his master's in public health at the American University of Beirut, followed by a PhD in anthropology at Harvard University. Currently, Dr. Dawachi is an associate professor of anthropology at Rutgers University. His research analyzes the social, medical, and environmental impacts of decades of war and violence in Iraq and the broader Middle East. He's the author of Ungovernable Life, Mandatory Medicine and Statecraft in Iraq, which was a winner of the New Millennium Book Prize from the Society of Medical Anthropology in 2019. The book documents the untold history of the rise of state medicine under decades of British and national rule, and the ultimate unraveling of the healthcare infrastructure and the exodus of Iraq's medical doctors under decades of US interventions and violence in the country. He has authored numerous reports and publications that have appeared in medical, anthropological, and global health journals, including The Lancet. His forthcoming manuscript, When Wounds Travel, Ecologies of War and Survival East of the Mediterranean, chronicles close to 10 years of ethnographic research and public health practice in the Middle East. Working towards an anthropology of wounding, the study explores the different physical and social experiences of the wound and its entanglement in the thickness of social relations of healthcare, displacement, and unraveling of healthcare infrastructure across Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. His work culminated in the inauguration of the Conflict Medicine Program at the American University of Beirut in Lebanon. That program is dedicated to the interdisciplinary study of the physical, psychological, and social manifestations of war wounds. Omar, it's truly an honor to have you with us today. I'm gonna to turn the floor to you. Thank you so much, Kave, for this uh, really generous introduction. And uh, thanks to the council for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, I'm very honored and, uh, and, and it gives me great pleasure to, to be here. And I'm, I'm really saddened that I can't be physically there. Uh, I want to also uh, give a, a shout out to Professor Marcia Inhorn, who was one of my first inspirations to uh, move into anthropology. I read her work back when I was a master's student in Beirut and uh, had a lot of uh, impact on the way I've, 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 I've been kind of thinking about medicine um, and, and biopolitics in general. So, um, so I'm, really, I'm really happy that she's also here in the audience. So uh, let me let me share my um, my screen. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give a, a try to kind of uh, finish within 40 minutes. Usually this is 
part of a, a longer talk that I give, and I usually show a, a video that kind of contextualizes some of the problem. I'll try to do that in a shorter way uh, this time, just to kind of have more time for uh, discussion um, uh, and uh, Q&A. So the title of my talk is When Wounds Travel, Ecologies of Wounds and Wounding East of the Mediterranean. Uh, I use the term East of the Mediterranean really uh, from a, I, I, I basically borrow it from a, a novel by the, the late uh, uh, Saudi-born uh, novelist, Abdurrahman Munif, who uh, wrote this novel, I guess, in the 70s, documenting uh, some of the uh, kind of an anonymous uh, Arab uh, state and the kind of the experience of, of, of torture and the imprisonment in a, this kind of authoritarian um, context. And I think there is something uh, about the, that kind of history coming to its, uh, its uh, logical conclusion over the past decades that I've been trying to capture in places like Iraq, Syria, and Lebanon. And eventually what I'm trying, what I'm interested in is, is, is this interconnected geography between these different areas, looking at how um, people, uh, uh, war machines or war machinery in general, and how also uh, bacteria and non-human and non-human kind of movement across these different geographies. So, um, so the what I'll also present today is a is a kind of a is a little bit of a medical mystery I've been that I've been tracing and following over the past uh, decade. So after the Iraq, uh, after the U.S. invasion of Iraq in two thousand and three, uh, there uh, there were uh, numerous uh, news uh, newspaper reports and uh, media reports on a mysterious uh, kind of superbug that was that was injuring or that was infecting a lot of the U.S. Uh, wounded soldiers in Iraq. And uh, there was a lot of reports in, in, in main uh, media outlets in the United States uh, talking about this um, invisible enemy, uh, this mysterious adversary that is uh, af affecting U.S. soldiers uh, in, the, uh, in the kind of aftermath, immediate aftermath of the war or of the occupation. And one of the things that this uh, uh, this infection was, or this superbug was being kind of infecting uh, U.S. soldiers and being carried uh, all the way from Iraq or from kind of the battle zone in Iraq and moving all the way to the United States and infecting people who've probably nev never been to a, uh, to a battle battlefield. And uh, so this is kind of a, a just a graph showing uh, the. Uh, the rise of this uh, antimicrobial resistance, specifically this bacteria called Acinetobacter bomanii, termed in, Ir in, in Iraq, used, the term is used in, uh, by, the US, so by the US military, is Iraqi bacter. Um, so we can see the kind of the rise of this, the number of infected uh, or wounded soldiers of this uh, superbug uh, in, t in kind of over the, the decades, over the, the, the years of the occupation. And there is also, like usually this is the video that I show, but if you uh, Google Nova Science Killer Microbe, you can see this, uh, vid this really interesting video that, uh, that captures really kind of the U.S. experience with the war. And it's basically presented by uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And the opening kind of uh, the opening statement uh, is that there is a killer uh, on the battle-torn streets of Iraq, but it does not carry a gun. It's attacking injured soldiers, and the culprit is a bacterium called Bomanii, referred to in Iraq as Iraqi bacter. This bug, this bug used to be relatively harmless, yet somehow it found a way to transform itself into a drug-resistant killer. What is really uh, uh, astonishing about all these reports from the U.S. is the absence of any uh, mention of what's happening in Iraq in terms of what's happening to the Iraqi population and what's happening in the kind of the broader story of this infection across uh, different kind of countries in the Middle East. Um, but, to, but just to give you a little bit of a, uh, of a bit of medical lingo and medical context here, and I know maybe um, this might be a little bit too much, but just to kind of give you a little bit of an idea, the name Acinetobacter comes from the uh, the uh, Greek uh, name. Uh, the uh, Acinito means like it, it means it lacks 
uh, cilia or it lacks uh, motility. And these are uh, non-motile rods because these bacteria could have these cilia that allows it to move. But these, this bacteria is a little bit kind of sluggish. It lingers around in, in, uh, in places. It's a gram-negative uh, cocobacillus. Uh, commonly found in the environment. It's actually present everywhere um, uh, in water and soil. However, the, uh, uh, the, the uh, multidrug resistant version of that uh, has been notorious for causing hospital-based infections. It accounts for around 2 to 10% of all gram-negative nosocomial infections in Europe and the United States. Uh, it easily acquires antibiotic resistance, mainly uh, uh, not only kind of as a, um, uh, as a, uh, like as it kind of passes it to the new uh, generations of this bacteria, but this bacteria has this ability to acquire resistance from other bacteria, uh, mainly through what, what is called um, uh, horizontal gene transfer. Um, and then there, this bacteria is also well known for formation of something called a biofilm. And this biofilm is uh, something that allows these different uh, uh, kind of colonies of this bacteria to stick to each other, uh, forming this kind of very resistant mucus, uh, uh, kind of vicious, uh, viscous uh, uh, substance that basically through this attachment, this kind of colony or this kind of bacterial community is, is able to transform information and uh, genes through this biofilm. Um, uh, it lingers for a long time on hard surfaces. That's why it's in hospitals. We see them in ICU units uh, and uh, they are hard, highly associated with open wounds and fractures in context of war and natural uh, disasters. Uh, and of course, this name, the moniker Iraqi Bacter, uh, has been given it given to it because of its association to the uh, Iraq War. Uh, however, over the 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 years after the occupation, what we have what we saw, of course, with the uh, explosion of different uh, conflicts across the region in in Syria, in Yemen, in Libya. Um, and of course, in Iraq, continued to go through a turmoil because of the ISIS war. We saw uh, a, a, a an explosion of these uh, superbugs in different conflict settings. And Acinetobacter bomaniae, this was one of the super one of these uh, multidrug resistant bacteria causing infections of uh, war wounds. But it was also one of the main uh, ones and a very difficult one to treat. The main problem is that it acquires resistance to most uh, uh, available antibiotics. And the main antibiotic that sometimes is used to deal with it right now is uh, very toxic. It's an antibiotic called colistin. And that antibiotic was, was used uh, in the 1960s and 70s and then was abandoned because it was toxic for the kidneys. But this, but this is, was the kind of the 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 kind of maybe the silver lining of of abandoning abandoning it. It's, it's now we can it's been now used to deal with very stubborn infections like Acinetobacter. But the 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 use of antibiotic this antibiotic has to be under uh, supervision, and many people actually die because of its the toxic effect of the antibiotic. So you can imagine the kind of the big burden uh, on healthcare systems on families on uh, and, and we're dealing in a in a complete kind of con context of war uh, where everything is kind of breaking uh, breaking down so one of the things that i've been trying to really ask uh, through this research uh, about this bacteria is what is iraqi about iraqi bacter of course we over uh, since since the covid we've we've been uh, very sensitive about the use of the China virus, and there's been a lot of the uh, uh, reaction to that. However, kind of this this name has been used with no really no uh, uh, backlash. No one really said anything about it uh, since it's been used. But but I want to take this name seriously and actually ask this question uh, um, in a more serious way and try to follow uh, what do we know about this uh, this uh, superbug and how can we understand its relationship to war and its relationship to the, uh, the Iraq context. Uh, 
So my story really begins, uh, and, and, and thanks to Kaveh, kind of introduced a bit my background. Uh, it, it really started for me understanding this problem with my becoming a physician in Iraq during the 1990s. And during that period, uh, I started medical training uh, in, um, in exactly in the wake, in the immediate aftermath of the, of the Gulf War. So I uh, started medical school in 1991 and graduated in 1997. Uh, um, uh, uh, and then from there, I worked for a year, a year and a half in, uh, uh, in Iraq's largest medical, uh, largest medical school, uh, largest medical hospital, Al Medina, uh, which was kind of the hub of uh, Iraq's healthcare across the country. It was the main referral uh, center where patients being sent from all across the country to, to this place. And of course, as many of you maybe uh, lived through that period or know about this history, in the 1990s, uh, the United States, uh, uh, to drive Iraq out of Kuwait, uh, built a coalition of 33 countries. And uh, during that period, it destroyed uh, a big uh, percentage of Iraq's infrastructure. Um, and imposed a, a 12 years of sanctions on the country uh, that has been kind of written a lot about and its impact on health and public health. Uh, and it's been kind of deemed as a kind of an invisible war uh, on Iraqi society. And this is an image of the uh, Al Medina where I did my medical training. And uh, one of the kind of the impacts of, uh, of uh, sanctions or of the sanctions on the Iraqi hospitals has been mainly the destruction of infrastructure, electricity, clean water supply, sewage management system, communication, bridges, etc. Uh, this, of course, impacted hospitals in, in, a, in a horrifying way. Uh, there is also the dual purpose list, uh, the UN United Nations created a list, uh, a huge list of, of items uh, that were, were deemed as dual use or dual purpose. Um, uh, anything that had a chemical uh, uh, component that could be used in or could be converted into some kind of a, a, a military purpose was put on this ban list and there was a long uh, process of giving approvals to these items. So things like chemotherapy, cleaning supplies because of the chlorine uh, in them, uh, and many medications were all under this, uh, under this list. Uh, of course, during this time, and which is what we kind of witnessed as a physician working in this in this uh, um, uh, in this unraveling of healthcare in Iraq and Iraq, uh, and I'll I'll come to this in a little bit, but but Iraq was one of the leading countries in the region in terms of healthcare. Um, there was widespread malnutrition, diarrheal diseases, and the kind of the doubling almost of uh, infant and maternal mortalities during that uh, period. Um, the uh, hospital infections increased dramatically, and that's why at that time, what we as doctors were, were doing to prevent uh, complications of infection, we would use broad spectrum antibiotics. So we would use like say three antibiotics on every patient who, go, who undergoes any kind of surgery. Uh, at that time, it was our kind of way to, um, uh, to prevent some of these infections or to control them. Uh, but this practice or this transformation of of, uh, uh, of antibiotic prescriptions eventually i think uh, had have had a, a, a long-term impact uh, the other kind of aspects were laboratory diagnostic supply breakdown and this also kind of feeds into the issue of diagnosing infections we were not able to depend on laboratory tests that's why uh, we would basically depend mostly on our clinical intuitions and our clinical uh, work um, and then, and then the big kind of social problem that emerged during the '90s because of the inflation of the Iraqi dinar and the deterioration of the livelihood is the emergence of black markets and corruption across all government institutions. Many of these medications, maybe they would arrive to the warehouses, but they would be, uh, uh, you know, taken out and sold in a black market. So there was this whole uh, uh, economy or kind of a black market economy happening around the hospital. And actually even many healthcare workers were involved in this uh, in this uh, black market. 
And of course, as as uh, as uh, many of you know, and I'll I'll come to maybe I'll speak a little bit about this uh, when I talk about my book in a bit, uh, is the exodus of the expert Iraqi doctors, and this this was a kind of a major disruption of knowledge transfer over these decades of nation building, where these expert doctors, many of them maybe had studied in the UK or have been working during the Iran Iraq War. A lot of them either left the country, uh, leaving behind a kind of a disrupted uh, or a discontinuation of forms of local knowledge and, and kind of knowledge transfer in in the setting of uh, in the setting of these hospitals. So so this is to give you so since when I started uh, kind of doing my PhD in the early two thousands uh, and of course this all coincided also with the invasion of Iraq in two thousand and three one of the really uh, incredible discourses emerging in the post. Uh, 2003 is this discourse around the ungovernability of Iraq. Uh, people kind of talked about Iraq uh, as an ungovernable country because of its um, inability uh, to kind of, you know, because of this kind of explosion, vi explosion of violence. Uh, people blame this on the different uh, uh, the more, uh, constituencies of the country, the Sunnis, the Shias, and the Kurds. Uh, others uh, kind of, uh, even academic writers, we're blaming this on uh, the uh, the failure in Iraq's history, nation building to create a, a kind of a national myth. There were kind of divisions in Iraq. And of course, there's there are other kind of discourses that kind of blamed everything on the militarization of the 1980s. Um, and but 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 I also kind of at that time, I wanted to follow this notion of the ungovernable uh, and these discourses about Iraq's ungovernability back to its history and try to see uh, what is the genealogy of these conversations. And of course, a lot of these um, discourses about Iraq were completely not recognizing the, the, uh, uh, the scale of the destruction of the state infrastructure and the kind of the inability uh, from the early 1990s uh, to the post-2003 in kind of maintaining some kind of a, um, a, a kind of sane practice of, of statehood mainly because of, of this all this constant breakdown and the uh, different uh, and the different transformation that happened during the 1990s. Iraq historically had been uh, kind of a black box for many in Middle East uh, scholars uh, they, because of the inability to travel there and inability to do any kind of empirical work. So a lot of the, the uh, social science uh, had kind of focused uh, or the political science that focused on the authoritarian regime, the repression of the Ba'ath Party, uh, the the kind of the disco the colonial archives, and there was little knowledge at that time of of the social uh, of the changes or the transformations happening in Iraqi society. Uh, I think uh, we we can, and this is something that I try to address in my uh, in my book Ungovernable Life, uh, which was a a kind of an attempt. To um, to do this genealogy of uh, the the present breakdown of the state infrastructure in Iraq, situating Iraq in a, a broader transnational history of medicine and empire, and one of the main arguments that I uh, have in the book, or at least the the main kind of frameworks, is thinking about healthcare as a the one of the main platforms of nation building and of state building in Iraq and the kind of the collapse of that kind of shows this this unraveling of the state uh, in the post 90s and of course post 2003 and one of the things that I try to uh, develop in the book is uh, this term mandatory medicine uh, which is which is a kind of an alternative to these discourses of the authoritarian and repressive uh, modes of power. Uh, uh, medicine was what I argued is a as a as a productive mode of power that allowed uh, uh, for for modes of governance to emerge in Iraq from the colonial period through the uh, post colonial context. And one of the things that I try to show through this. Uh, a historical account uh, is the kind of the role of doctors and their ambivalence uh, in relationship to this history. 
Um, and, and, and of course, the book does not only deal with Iraq, but actually does my, a lot of my ethnography, ethnographic fieldwork, of course, I build on a lot of archival research and archival documentation, but my ethnographic work was amongst a lot of Iraqi doctors who ended up in the UK. Um, so I, I looked at kind of how uh, the early years of the Iraqi state a building project was about Britain in the in Iraq, and then these kind of later uh, periods, we are looking at these Iraqi doctors in the UK, where uh, they are trying to uh, integrate into into Britain's uh, NHS system as a, a, a kind of and through that rethinking the idea of healthcare migration and the changing this this changing relationship between center and periphery. Um, the other kind of uh, uh, framework or method of this book was it was developing this notion of or this concept of ungovernability as an analytic and as a method uh, using it to kind of think through the uh, this idea of biopolitics being enmeshed in the disordered operations of power so rather than looking at governmentality or governance as a fait accompli as a kind of a, a just a top-down way like the way let's say Foucauldian scholars have approached it I was interested more in how uh, uh, power in, is in a constant production of that which it disavows. It's, it's in production of its own other in a, in, in a constant way. So this was a little bit more of the theoretical uh, framework that I developed uh, through this work. Uh, and of course, all of this was trying to set up the, uh, the stage for an ethnographic investigation of what I'm calling the ecologies of war in the Middle East, uh, thinking about how the 2003 war and, of course, all this aftermath of, of the outbreak of different conflicts had kind of has a much more broader regional impact. Um, uh, just to kind of give you a little bit of a very fast uh, overview of the book, it starts with uh, kind of it's uh, chronologically structured. It deals with the kind of the arrival of the British and their uh, experience with uh, with the with illness and actually more uh, more British soldiers died from diarrheal diseases and and uh, heat strokes and all these kind of illnesses than they than those who died in battle so so healthcare was a very central problem for the colonial uh, the British uh, uh, military and the British administration afterwards of the mandate and became so central in the uh, development of Iraq's uh, uh, healthcare as a universal healthcare uh, through universal healthcare coverage and through uh, creating really a very strong centralized healthcare system uh, and medical education to deal with uh, Iraq as a kind of a, as, a, as, as a pathological problem, as a con in a constant uh, state of, of uh, emerging pathologies. Um, I also kind of document how uh, me medicine and healthcare becomes very important in the urban uh, uh, development uh, projects in Iraq, uh, the, uh, especially con documenting this uh, 1950s uh, era uh, of uh, international development and national development where we you, where the city and the urban uh, uh, context becomes a, a main stage for kind of uh, urban illnesses and discourses about uh, uh, ungovernability of of the uh, migrants who come who came to Iraq to came to the city from rural areas I also show how uh, healthcare and medicine was very central in the Iran-Iraq war, and specifically uh, how the state turned into uh, the uh, the woman population in the country to cultivate a certain biopolitics in the country, where uh, uh, massive uh, campaigns of vaccination, uh, healthcare interventions were all uh, being. Um, uh, uh, really engineered during the war and in, in fact during the Iraq-Iran war in both countries healthcare improved dramatically uh, infant mortality uh, was cut down maternal mortality was cut down thanks to do these uh, campaign uh, mainly women women's uh, uh, campaigns to educate and uh, promote uh, vaccination and of course there's a lot of problems with these with these campaigns but it definitely uh, redefined what does it what does it mean for uh, you know th this tension between soldiers dying on the front line and the attempt of the state to cultivate the lives of its infants and its uh, 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 its kind of you know internal fronts in, in many ways and of course the 
the final, the final uh, chapter of this story uh, uh, follows these doctors uh, who are escaping from Iraq, uh, arriving in the UK, uh, becoming part of an asylum process, and trying to integrate in the National Health uh, Service uh, a, a kind of a system, uh, a post-colonial system in its own, partly because it was uh, really uh, created in Britain in the immediate aftermath of Britain's withdrawal from India. And if you kind of look at the demographics of this uh, NHS system, you will see two thirds of the employees of, of uh, the NHS are uh, from overseas and they are mainly from uh, colonies, ex-colonies of Britain. So, so in many ways, Britain's withdrawal from as a kind of, or its shrinking of its empire came with also uh, absorption of a lot of the labor from uh, the, um, the ex-colonies into NHS to save Britain to provide health care for its own national population. So, so I, I, I argue that the NHS needs to be seen as a, as a kind of a really a post-colonial uh, uh, infrastructure par excellence. Um, however, one of the things after I finished my work, I arrived in Beirut in 2011, and this was immediately kind of also in the, um, uh, really at the outbreak of the, what later became known as the Arab Spring. And during that time, I, 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 was, I was confronted with Iraqi patients once again uh, in the streets of Beirut, and I was seeing a lot of Iraqis coming in for uh, healthcare, for medical treatment in Beirut's kind of uh, different hospitals. And uh, this is like one of the the main hospitals where I, I you know, I, I worked in that un in the university, the American University of Beirut. And we can see like from 2006, 2007, a kind of a, a shoot up of the number of patients coming into the place. So I began really a project uh, trying to uh, uh, develop a, a kind of an understanding of these, uh, these this therapeutic travel of Iraqis and of course, at that time, also Syrians who were kind of coming into Lebanon in big numbers, and uh, and so so uh, the, one of the biggest kind of uh, po this population of uh, therapeutic travelers, where a lot of them were either cancer cases or were uh, cases injured from the uh, the kind of the epidemic of violence in Iraq uh, that you know the suicide bombings, the U.S. Uh, uh, violence in the country, uh, the the kind of the the unruly um, criminal gangs that kind of started kidnapping and killing people. Uh, and so I began to develop really a, um, a framework around these notion of the traveling wounds um, uh, and looking at this movement of these patients across these different uh, national and transnational borders. Iraqi patients were traveling to India, to Iran, to Turkey, uh, to Jordan, to Syria, even before, that is before the outbreak of the war in Syria, to seek healthcare. So there was this, this really larger network of travel happening, and many of them were not necessarily rich patients. Uh, some of them were selling uh, property or, or doing, um, or uh, trying to uh, get money from the state or money from uh, religious organizations to, to, uh, to cover their travel. Um, so what I really became interested in is to look at what I call the biosocial life of the wound, exploring this entanglement of biological, environmental, and social processes. Uh, looking, developing the wound as a method, uh, I ask the question: What is revealed uh, in the wound? You know, what kind of what kind of bio biography it tells us in terms of patient history, social relations, interactions, but also in terms of medical and environmental um, uh, materiality that we can, we can kind of uh, understand in, the, uh, in, in analyzing the wound as a, as a biological construct here. Um, so in many ways, I was like, you know, to kind of uh, look at, uh, at the kind of these, this triangle of what I, uh, looking at the symbolic, I mean, the wound in, in the Middle East is used, the, the, the word the jarh uh, is used a lot in, uh, in, uh, in, in, as a poetic or as a metaphor for uh, talking about uh, different elements, you know, it, come, it goes from like a personal insult they say, you know, uh, you, you, you wounded me and to these kind of physical injuries. And it's kind of very much part of how people narrate grievances, pain. Um, uh, and uh, and I, I became, I mean, I wrote a few pieces I, I can share with them. Uh, I, sh I can share them about what I call the social wound uh, and specifically looking at tensions between different uh, 
refugee populations uh, around their own kind of grievances. But I've also looked, I've developed some, some uh, essays around the wound as a method, trying to kind of cover all these different uh, elements of, um, uh, of wounds and wounding. Uh, one of the first kind of uh, pieces that came out from this work was uh, a piece in The Lancet, which was just trying to uh, really uh, redefine this therapeutic, ge what I'm calling therapeutic geographies of the Iraq and Sy Iraqi and Syrian wars, um, uh, kind of undermining some of the, the ways public health and global health looks at issues of um, war and healthcare, mainly seeing national systems of healthcare as kind of an entity and the refugees and the kind of the refugee camp as another entity. So, so I, we, what we were trying to do in this, uh, in this piece is to open up this definition of these healthcare systems or healthcare hubs through looking at the movement of patients and refugees across borders. So it kind of, it, it became an interesting methodological piece to think a little bit in a different way about uh, what we call health systems or what does it mean to really uh, talk about healthcare and health systems in a context of war. Uh, I in Beirut, as Kave uh, explained, I I, wor I worked actually co-founded the conflict medicine program uh, with my colleague uh, Hassan Abu Sitta, who is here in the picture. Um, he's a plastic surgeon, uh, a, a British a Palestinian a plastic surgeon, and we kind of developed this practice uh, around uh, the idea of looking at this this conflict medicine as a form of a social medicine uh, from the global south, looking at kind of expertise and knowledge production and thinking. Uh, through use of anthropology, medicine, uh, epidem social epidemiology, and trying to kind of put together uh, uh, the story and the context of war in uh, the Middle East, actually. And then we, we just recently came out with a special issue in Merib, uh, uh, where I interviewed Rassan about our work, and then there are really other interesting pieces at that time. Um, uh, I'll, I'll try to move very quickly, I think, because uh, I'm, I think I'm... I'm realizing we may be running out of time, but but one of the other hubs that I looked at was the MSF Humanitarian Hospital in Amman. Um, and this is a hospital that was established in 2006 and uh, began to uh, provide services for uh, patients coming from war zones. Uh, and, you know, I can speak more about this, but this is also defined a turn in humanitarian medicine uh, in terms of uh, uh, responding to war, the the endemicity of war injuries and war, and the need for more war surgery in in across the Middle East region. Uh, a lot of the people uh, who who we saw there are family members. You can see members of the same family injured in these bombing at, uh, uh, events, uh, and actually a lot of the doctors who worked there were also. Iraqi doctors who had some experiences with with dealing with war surgery over the decades of, of uh, conflicts in the country. However, one of the things that kind of emerged out of this work is uh, is this kind of uh, narrative about the toxicity of some of these wounds that we we, we were seeing in the hospital. So uh, uh, this is a quote from a, an AUB a uh, surgeon who uh, uh, he he was kind of talking about how some of uh, these wounds are stubborn wounds these uh, that we see that they're seeing coming from Iraq there were a lot of cancer cases uh, uh, in, amongst the younger generation uh, among the uh, unusually younger population and that a lot of the wounded who came for reconstructive surgery or uh, treatment in AUB uh, had these uh, superbugs of course during that time uh, the this this issue became much more uh, 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 well known across different conflicts in the region and a lot of what been, was uh, being uh, kind of assigned to is this idea of antibiotic anarchy um, the idea that you know people during war uh, because of the kind of the breakdown of healthcare and also the, uh, the, the use and abuse of antibiotics in the context of war was being blamed for this. However, there, uh, from from conducting ethnography, one of the, th the the most amazing things about ethnographic work in these contexts, and as a medical ethnographer, medical anthropologist, uh, is eth ethnography works like a, a an early warning sign. It begins to detect some of the things that we um, 
so that we just basically epidemiology doesn't really catch uh, uh, very quickly. So what was really one of the interesting uh, uh, findings, or at least kind of one of the signals that came out of uh, this work is that multidrug resistance acinetobacter had kind of begins to emerge at a global level immediately after the 2003 invasion of Iraq. And one of the interesting aspects is the changing nature of conflicts and the uh, failure of reconstruction, what, we've, what, what led to this kind of constant, this collapse of infection control in civilian hospitals and the movement of wounded across regional uh, therapeutic hubs and with them, of course, uh, the movement of bacteria. Uh, the, the other thing, the use and abuse of antibiotics during the war uh, and sanctions, uh, it, and this is the story that I was telling a little bit about in the early in the talk, uh, con uh, kind of also contributed to this pervasiveness of antibiotic anarchy um, and the conditions of hospital care and conflict setting. Uh, it, it questions this dichotomy of between community acquired the, uh, infections and uh, what is called the hospital acquired infection. The the other kind of really important fi uh, uh, finding here was the was the changing of the chemical milieu of war uh, or of antimicrobial resistance. Um, uh, these uh, the war became like a selective environmental event heavy metal contamination of soil and water uh, had been shown to actually drive antimicrobial resistant in different uh, uh, bacterial species including uh, 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 acinetobacter bumanii and uh, this is from literature coming from industrial and agricultural areas. However, there was nothing really written about conflict zone and how this heavy metal uh, could be driving heavy metal contamination from weaponry, from uh, collapsed buildings was driving this uh, problem. Uh, uh, the uh, so these are some of the kind of the observations that we had. I uh, you know I'll go through this very quickly, but we we basically uh, started a team of microbiologists, uh, historians, anthropologists to try to begin to look at this problem. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about this, uh, but we uh, basically uh, the framework that we worked with is the work of Hannah Landeker, uh, a famous historian, sociologist of uh, science, who written the kind of ultimate piece about antimicrobial resistance and what she calls the biology of history. Um, the idea that uh, the resistance of antibiotic that we see right now is a byproduct of human activities. Uh, so, so the more we have used uh, the way and the, the more we've used antibiotics and the way we've used antibiotics had actually changed the, the bacterial uh, uh, kind of uh, ontology in many ways, uh, uh, shaping, a, uh, uh, shaping a new genetic makeup of this very resistant bacteria. So we were working with these two hypotheses that sanctions had kind of been driving this this problem, and then the other one is that heavy metal contamination, particularly in conflict, is causing what we are seeing in, in in Iraq. So of course, this goes back to this point that I, I I raised in the beginning: is that the changing changes in wound care and antibiotic prescription? To what extent this has been driving this problem uh, that we are seeing uh, right now? Some of the work that we've been doing is trying to uh, document an archive and uh, uh, through genetic sequencing of an archive of bacteria that we found in uh, hospitals like the American University of Beirut and trying to really uh, figure out how uh, we can actually trace uh, some of these environmental events to, uh, uh, to uh, some of these kind of uh, genetic events to kind of broader political uh, stories. And this is through a process called uh, phylogenetic analysis uh, through documenting kind of the kinships of this bacteria over time. So in many ways, thinking about this idea of the acinetobacter as an archive of, of war. Uh, just one, like maybe last thing before I, I conclude is that this, this issue of, uh, of uh, antimicrobial resistance has become now very uh, 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 kind of under focus due to the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, many cases in Lebanon and other places in the Middle East, uh, we're seeing high rates of deaths in ICU, not necessarily from COVID, but we're seeing patients coming in COVID positive, but then they die COVID negative, mainly because they, 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 they pick up these infections in hospitals. And in many ways, this is a whole kind of uh, project that I'm trying now to think about is how hospitals are becoming increasingly toxic places 
in countries like Lebanon or Iraq or uh, other parts of the Middle East. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll skip this part. I think all of these points, I've already mentioned them. I'll finish by reading a, a kind of part of my uh, conclusion uh, from, uh, from Ungovernable Life, which kind of, end, I end the book with this story, but just the beginning of it. Um, uh, so the Iraq experiment seems to have conditioned an ecology of state collapse that has spread like a pathogen to states elsewhere in the region. And it has the potential of spreading elsewhere under the guise of the global war on terror. Uh, symptomatic of the, this ecology is the breakdown of one's robust healthcare systems like the one in Iraq. Whether this collapse has been part of systematic efforts to dis dismantle the state and render life ungovernable or merely a byproduct of contingencies like Western powers, ignorance, disorganization, and bad faith cannot be answered here. It is ironic, however, uh, how after Iraq's decade-long struggle to establish and improve a national healthcare infrastructure, the usually muscular afflictions suffered by Iraq's keys today echo the orientalizing pathologies that the first generation of British Indian army officers ascribe to the land they would occupy. Depictions of a toxic environment riddled with tropical maladies have been uh, super spreaded, uh, su super, superseded sorry, by clinical reports of a spike in cancer rates and the spread of Iraqi bacter, both formed in the crucible of international sanctions, conquest, and occupation. There is a cruel symmetry in this imperial legacy. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dawachi. Fascinating uh, talk. Really, really appreciate it. Um, Participants, please uh, put your questions in the questions and answer uh, section. Um, if you don't mind, maybe I'll just start um, asking. I have a couple, many questions, but I'll just start with the first one. You know, this um, antimicrobial resistance as an infectious disease epidemiologist, we certainly talk about this quite a bit. Uh, there is a lot of literature out there, and it is considered a major global health threat. But I must admit, um, the relationship between at antimicrobial resistance and war and conflict, that I feel like is pretty understudied. And I'm fascinated that you're focusing on this topic. And I'm wondering, um, are you finding funding sources out there that are interested in this? Is NIH interested in this? Uh, is the, I don't know, Gates Foundation? Who, who is interested in trying to really dig deep into antimicrobial resistance and its relationship with war and conflict. Right, right, great, great question, Kaveh. Um, so, so I just kind of didn't mention this because I was going very fast. One of the things that we've been trying to do over the past three, four years with this group is to put together a very comprehensive research project where it has a laboratory component where we kind of uh, collect the bacteria from war zones uh, and try to kind of do this kind of genetic sequencing. Also, uh, we uh, collaborated with MSF and ICRC to do a, a cohort of an epidemiological study on wound infection. So we would actually kind of monitor or at least follow up uh, cases um, over time in settings of conflict, like uh, especially MSF hospitals in Amman or MSF hospitals in Beirut. Uh, sorry, in Tripoli or MSF hospital in Mosul. And there is also work in Gaza that was also being interesting. So we wanted to really do a comparative uh, study to follow up what is happening at the level of ep epidemiologically at the clinical level. And there were also environmental scientists who are planning to sample the environment. And this is all under the umbrella of like history of science and medical anthropology, where we are able to uh, through filling the gaps of history and of, 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 of social ethnography or ethnographic work um, uh, to try to understand this. We, we applied twice to major, major grants, and some of them were fit, perfect fit for what we were doing. But in both cases, we, I mean, and we had really the top scientists who work on these issues, but in both cases, we, we didn't get, the, uh, we didn't get uh, funded for that. You know, it could be for many reasons, could be technical, uh, but I think there is a little bit of a reluctance uh, to fund projects like this, mainly because what it could actually, the implications of this 
uh, in terms of these wars and interventions in the region that could actually raise a lot of um, questions that many don't want to really uh, uh, kind of open up. Okay. Um, I see a question from our wonderful colleague, Marsha Inhorn. Uh, uh, thank you, Omar, for one of the most in important and fascinating talks I've heard in ages. Um, so few people in this country remember this history of United States intervention in Iraq. Iraq is relatively forgotten in comparison to Syria right now. I would be interested in your thoughts about this omission, but also about how all of your concepts and concerns travel uh, refers to the Syrian setting. Are the same kinds of problems being seen there now? Who is studying or able to study these issues in Syria? And she thanks you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Marcia. I'm so happy that you're here. And thanks for this uh, great question. Um, so yes, I think, I think there is something very strange about this, um, this uh, th this muting of the Iraq story. Uh, I think it's uh, it's kind of, you know, someone called it once uh, America's uh, uh, biggest trauma of the 21st century, you know? It's like something that, that has kind of w did not sit well with the American, with the, U with the American and Western psyche, mainly because of the um, uh, uh, incommensurability of things, you know, they, you have these governments who are waging war and during the, the before the war, they were then the, probably one of the largest uh, global demonstrations uh, against that war. And of course, when even e there is a kind of a short memory with uh, with understanding that Iraq has been a kind of a subject of US military action or object of these interventions for for now more than 20, uh, I guess now 30 years, uh, we're talking actually more, since the 1990s. And 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 this is completely uh, out of uh, the the kind of the discourse about about uh, about the region or what what has happened in uh, in Iraq after 2003. So I think I you know one of the things like in a way it's my predicament is to bring this back up. It's, you know, it's like this return, the return of the repressed. Uh, to, to put it back again and say, you know, this is, this history it did not go away. This history is still haunting us. And it's not only haunting us in Iraq, but it's haunting us across the region. And it will have a, a huge impact globally and how it will, like these wars, are driving antimicrobial resistance. One of the biggest uh, uh, problems that we're going to be facing over the next decades, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if if the, the the international community will not respond to this. Uh, so and and so this was for the first part. I'm 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 still trying to figure out why this this uh, this kind of forgotten aspect uh, of the Iraq War. Uh, so I mean, you know, I, I would love any kind of input on that. The other thing about Syria, yes, I think I think Syria, uh, 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 there's a lot of these kind of issues could be uh, could travel to Syria and then travel from Syria, and I think this is what we saw in terms of the displacement of the uh, of the migrants or and of the refugees. And in fact, actually, a lot of the times in many Western countries of uh, in Europe, uh, the 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 antimicrobial resistance was one of the biggest concerns uh, that these refugees are carrying with them into these countries. So there were all these papers about how these uh, refugees were carrying antimicrobial resistance with them. They were, you know, a lot of them were tested. They were screened. So there was a lot of this interesting uh, connection between these issues. And indeed, what I want to really, what what I, what this second project, the writing of the second project, although it stems from the Iraq story, but from the fact that I was in Beirut, I was a kind of a witness, or I, my ethnography was not just about Iraqis, was 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 looking at uh, how Syrians uh, were coming to Iraq. We were also looking at some of these infections among Syrian population. Um, uh, but and, and, and the idea here is to really tell a story that goes beyond these kind of national histories, a story that is about a, a kind of an interconnected geography um, uh, where you see healthcare, human agony, uh, displacement, 
uh, uh, and uh, and uh, kind of you know destruction are happening in, in in a place in these places and of course all of this is in the wake of uh, these kind of failed uprisings uh, across the region and it kind of leaves me with a very kind of dark uh, ending or or a kind of a very pessimistic kind of perspective uh, on on this but i'm trying to also develop a a kind of a, a, a different language, maybe a different frameworks, especially focusing on this idea of the wound, the wound not only just as a physical injury, but as something could be seen as mental, uh, as uh, social and as historical, something that could actually um, allow us to understand some of these grievances across this, 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 uh, this, uh, you know, geography of, uh, of war and, and medicine. Yeah. Thank you, Omar. Um, I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm going to ask you a question. Well, the session ends at 1. We can go uh, probably till 1.15. So those of you who do have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box, and we'll be happy to bring them up for the next 15 minutes. Um, uh, Omar, I really would love to go back to conflict medicine program. I think that's a fascinating program, which I honestly, I'm not sure any other university except the American University of Beirut under the, your leadership and your colleague, Dr. Ghassan Abusita, developed. Um, I would love to learn a little bit more about that. And um, I want to tell you a little bit of background is, as a public health person, um, I've been really fascinated by a number of public health academicians who are making an argument that war should be seen as a public health problem, as a public health challenge. And public health professionals, whether they're academicians or practitioners, they have an important role to play in prevention of conflict and war and dealing with its consequences. Mm -hmm. And honestly, this is a relatively, I would say, uh, new. <laughs> uh, wars have been going on for decades and decades, but very few schools of public health have some kind of a program, courses, initiatives on war and public health. And you developed this conflict medicine. Sounds like it had a clinical uh, and social and other environmental. But I would be fascinated in your um, thoughts about war as a public health problem. And right. do you see a role and contribution for public health folks to play in prevention of war? Right. No, th thanks for the, uh, the question, Kaveh. Uh, definitely. I, I think... I, I think probably war has been seen as a uh, uh, as a public health problem from long time ago i don't think necessarily it is def relatively new but i think as as you rightly say there hasn't been so much attention to that um uh, I, I would say even like uh, international organizations like uh, UNICEF and their uh, kind of whole uh, child survival strategies back in the 1980s was designed around uh, settings of conflict attempts to try to provide uh, healthcare and public health to uh, settings of conflict and trying to kind of create a ceasefire to allow supply to arrive. So th this is, I, I think that there has been in terms of practice uh, this kind of element. And of course, there are all these interesting stories of these uh, kind of solo doctors and uh, who work in con conflict settings, memoirs of, of doctors who really kind of documented some of this issue. But indeed, I think I think uh, uh, the uh, the some of some of the public health uh, literature, or at least orientation, has been mostly um, depoliticized. Uh, it's it's uh, you know people don't want to get into these these uh, uh, conversations about war uh, because because they think it's just too political. It will bring uh, bring uh, bring them under the kind of the the microscope in terms of funding and getting funding. If you're criticizing the states that are waging war, you probably want so mu there might be some uh, you know complicity there. Um, but I think uh, uh, over the past decades, there has been increasing uh, voices uh, talking about the impact of war, especially with now we're seeing these more protracted conflicts like lasting for 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 decades. I mean, you know, we are now in the 10th anniversary of the Syrian conflict. Uh, one of the problems that you see, for example, is that now a lot of the focus on in in, in terms of the discourses about uh, the Syria war is just attacks on healthcare. 
you know, as if this is the only problem that we get from uh, from these conflicts. Uh, uh, this this all comes with this idea that medicine should be neutral, but it is not really addressing the kind of the broader environmental, uh, social, uh, uh, and uh, uh, kind of psychological impacts. Uh, of these conflicts. But of course, there are really interesting attempts to documenting trauma, doc documenting refugee situation. So I, I, I think it is all there, but I think one of the, the, uh, one of the uh, problems has been already pre-existing models. I think this is the challenge. As an, as an anthropologist, what I at least like about this discipline for me and what I'm, is I'm thrown into the reality of the situation and I have to make sense of it. Hmm. I try not to, uh, let's say, uh, come in with preconceived notions of frameworks. So I think this is what, what we learn in, uh, at least in anthropology, is we build our kind of frameworks from the bottom up. And, and this has allowed us in the conflict medicine program to, to that's how we, we, we worked. Uh, we began by noticing these phenomena, these Iraqis coming into, into Beirut. What is going on there? Why is this happening? And the more we investigated, the more this notion of the wound or the, the injuries became very clear that this is, an, this is a kind of a lens into understanding uh, injury uh, as, as many of these uh, patients were being injured and then you send them back, they get re-injured. So, so this, the, the, that wound became like an interesting both as a, as a clinical problem, but also as an interesting social uh, problem, especially if you look at, let's say, let's say sectarian war between, between different groups as a certain kind of wound, you know, and, and people will tell you that every time you talk about Iraq, everyone, when I talk about with, with, with a lot of people I know, and this is like, it's a big wound for them. Um, people cannot go back to the country. People are, you know, the violence is, 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 is heavy. People have lost many members of their families. So, so that was a kind of a good entry point for us to build something around it. And it's not really just about clinical medicine. I think that's kind of one of the biggest problems that I saw working in public health is this, is this dichotomy between medicine and public health. This, this really reluctance of public health people to engage uh, biomedicine and the biomedical people of really even trying to understand population level uh, issues. I think the bridge for me was... Uh, was this kind of uh, medical anthropology and being a clinician myself, although I don't practice anymore, but that really helped in 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 in, in bridging bridging the 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 broader public health eye or perspective on these conflicts and the kind of the everyday realities that we see uh, in in these in these cases. And, and and you know one of the biggest thing that we try to do is not only just to document these stories, but also to uh, highlight the uh, the limits of, let's say, medical training in the in in, in the Middle East. Uh, although conflict has been kind of uh, happening for a long time, and cases like war injuries and conflict injuries are seen constantly, but the curriculums that that medical students were studying had none of this. You know, unless you kind of specialize in a. Uh, in reconstructive surgery, you don't really get a kind of a rethinking of the medical curriculum to 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 adapt or to uh, be in tune with uh, the realities of clinical or the clinical realities that these doctors and public health uh, professionals are seeing. You know, and in 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 public health also suffers from these models that are developed in in you know. And although I'm speaking in an Ivy League place, but, you know, it's these Ivy League models and theories that get developed and then get kind of comes and you kind of go there and they, they, people come from abroad and they think they know better than, than you who have lived in, in that area. So a lot of these problems, I think, are, are, are symptomatic of, uh, of a kind of a depoliticization of a, of a little bit of maybe a, re a reluctance of engagement with a much more everyday realities of these conflicts and what they mean and, and, and really undoing a lot of what we already know or at least what we think uh, about what we know uh, about these, these, these places. Thank you so much. Um, I'm not seeing any other question and I wanna be respectful of your time. Thank you so much, Dr. Dawachi, for an amazing talk. Uh, I wish you and your family the best and I hope you're really, really important project moves forward. Uh, 
Thank you so Thank much, you. Gabe. And thanks Thank for you. having me. Thanks to everyone. Um, thanks to Marwa specifically for for organizing <laughs> and 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 being kind of really following up with everything. So, shukran. Thank you, Omar. Take care. Ciao. Bye, everybody.